All right, so by way of introduction, uh, introduction uh, my name is Andrew Middleton. I am a geographic information specialist. That means I make maps with computers. I've been doing it for about 10 years now, and I live in Oakland, California. Um, in 2015, some friends of mine and I uh, got scuba certified, and it was only natural then that um, I wanted to combine my two loves of, of mapping and, and scuba diving. And uh, and when I visited Point Lobos for the first time, I, I knew that I needed to figure out a way to make a map of Point Lobos as well, uh, in particular. Um, I've just got a quick video here. I feel like this is just kind of important to, to set the scene here. Um, Point Lobos is not a coral reef. I feel like Planet Earth and David Attenborough are really great at showing people what coral reefs look like. Um, Point Lobos is really incredible because we have this abundant kelp. Um, we have so much wildlife. Uh, it's, it's cold. It can be dark. It's not the easiest scuba diving in the world, but it is an incredibly special place to visit. Oh, here we go. We got a sea lion coming through here to visit. Um, it's really one of my favorite places on earth. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to help more people explore this beautiful place. Um, uh, here's another photograph of me. This is with my secondhand scuba equipment. Actually, I bought all of this stuff off of my parents because uh, they got into diving before I did. Um, so if, we, if we're talking about like the history of mapping Point Lobos, um, you know, at the, at the risk of starting when the earth cooled, you know, uh, I think a good place to start is uh, in the 1700s. The, um, uh, the Spanish conquistadors were sailing up and down uh, the Pacific coast. They were mostly interested in establishing a colony. They were interested in getting from point A to point B by ocean. They weren't all that interested in land routes, or at least not at this time. This, this map is from um, the late 1700s. And you can see the coastline's pretty rough. Most of it was, was sighted from um, from a boat. They didn't really get out a whole lot at this, at this stage. Um, if we look in a little bit closer, uh, we can see where uh, um, the, the Carmel mission is. Uh, you can see that they, they call uh, Point Lobos um, Point Carmelo uh, after, after the mission. Uh, and you can see um, Cypress Point over here, uh, which is now where um, Pebble Beach Golf Course is. So we're looking at, um, at uh, um, uh, this is Monastery Beach right here, right by the Carmel River. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's mostly with an eye to, to naval navigation. You can see these little X's here. That's basically where rocks are that uh, ships shouldn't get too close by. So this is a nautical chart. It's not really a land map. It's not really a water map either. Um, but in the 1930s, uh, we started getting some, some more detailed maps. Uh, this is actually from when the area was being surveyed for inclusion in the California State Park system. Um, if if, if um, folks know the name, um, Frederick Law Olmsted, uh, the famous uh, landscape architect and, and designer of, of all kinds of um, famous parks in the American public imagination. Uh, this was uh, his son who owned a surveying company on the East Coast and um, and, and they surveyed the whole area so that they could know exactly what it was that they were trying to protect and donate to the state of California for the purposes of preservation. Um, and these maps are pretty cool. I'm, I'm, I like the style. I like the detail. Um, it looks pretty accurate to what we see in Point Lobos today. Um, you know, all the, um, uh, the road work is still here. Um, but once, once the land reaches the water, it's all unknown. Um, it's like the map has no information as soon as it gets wet. Um, so this is a really cool map for folks on land. Um, but again, for people interested in getting under the water, not as useful. Um, yeah, here's, here's a close up of uh, Whaler's Cove. This is the place where divers today like to get in the water. Uh, it is the only uh, scuba diving accessible place in the whole park. Um, and, and you can see that there's just no information about uh, what's even even uh, a, a few feet offshore. Um, in the 80s, we got we got more uh, more information. This is um, uh, a really cool map that I, I really like. This is from a textbook from uh, the U.S. Geological Survey, um, and uh, it was it was um, done by a fellow named um, uh, Tau Rho Alpha, which is a pretty pretty memorable name. Oh, part yeah, Tau Rho Alpha. Um, Actual, that is their real name. That's not a, it's not a moniker. Um, and, uh, and in this map, you can see um, Point Lobos here. We're, we're looking at an oblique view. This is Whaler's Cove right here. 
and and we can see the Carmel Trench, which is just offshore. It's um, it's close to a mile deep, and it's right up next to shore. It's a really incredible landscape feature that most people will never see. Um, it's 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 like having uh, the Grand Canyon in your backyard and not knowing it uh, for all this time. So that's it's it's a cool feature. Most of this information was gathered from um, the very sophisticated method of of um, lowering. Uh, lowering ropes with weights on them all the way to the bottom, uh, getting your sounding that way, and, uh, and then connecting the dots and imagining what the underwater landscape looks like and sort of connecting those dots. Um, so I, I love how much this work is this map this is thing doing. On the underwater reserve. I love how much work that this map is doing with, with so little actual information in it. I think this was, this was right when they were, um, they, had, they hadn't done a full sonar survey of this area yet. Um, and and today a lot of the maps are also pretty pretty simple. You know they get to the point. This is this is a map from um, uh, the Point Lobos uh, um, State Park, uh, where it just tells you like here's where to get in the water, here's where uh, uh, the reserve is, here's where you can't go fishing, um, and that's and that's kind of it. Um, for those of you who are interested in diving, there's a there's a great company called Franco Maps that makes. Uh, dive and adventure maps uh, around the world for, for different destinations. You can find them in Hawaii, you can find them in Bonaire and um, all kinds of um, uh, great places to go on a like a mountain biking or a scuba diving adventure. Um, they don't know it yet. Uh, they have no idea who I am, uh, but unbeknownst to them, uh, they are my nemesis. Um, I, I think they, they put together a, a, a fine product. I just think that we can do a lot more with the data that we now have available. You know, Franco is working on a much larger global scale and, uh, um, you know, it, again, it'll tell you where to get in the water all, all around the region, but it doesn't tell you what the bottom looks like. We kind of have this shading of kind of the suggestion of, of the Carmel Trench. We kind of get an idea for topography, um, but we're, we're, we're still kind of approaching like an impression of the landscape. Um, so now we're getting into like the last 20 or 30 years. Um, uh, sonar has been around since like the 1930s. It's the idea that we're, we're, we're making a big loud sound um, and we're listening for the echoes as the water, as the, as the sound travels through the water, bounces off the, off the rock on the bottom and then comes back up to a receiver. It's a type of active remote sensing. Um, so it, it, you know, we're, we're sending out a signal and we're listening for the echo. Um, you need a big boat to do it. You need a, you need a big honking piece of sonar equipment um, some of the really large units can be a couple of tons, and you need a big boat. So what's, what's nice about this is for being in the open ocean, it's very easy to make maps very quickly uh, within a pretty narrow swath under the vessel. Um, but for people like me who want to, oh, pardon me, this is, this is um, uh, how we convert a, a three-dimensional signal into sort of a two-dimensional image. Um, so uh, each each depth as measured by the by a sonar ping uh, is represented um, just like a photograph as a, as a raster with a, a bunch of little pixels. If you zoom into a photograph, you know, you get down into, into the tiny little pixel elements, you get into to little dots. Um, we're representing three-dimensional terrain on a, on a two-dimensional plane uh, where instead of recording color like we do for a digital photograph, we're recording uh, depth information uh, from the sonar. Um, and, and we can do really cool stuff with that data. This is an app called Explore. I have nothing to do with it. They, they, they um, uh, got their most of their data from uh, CSU Monterey Bay. Um, this is actually an, an augmented reality thing where you can download it to your phone and you can use your phone to um, uh, uh, project the image of Point Lobos uh, on your floor or on your kitchen table or however you want to view it, and you can sort of walk around it and look at it from different angles. It's a pretty cool thing. But as you can see, there isn't really great data around the coastlines. And that's because with um, a big sonar equipped vessel, it's a lot easier to, to, to map the open ocean than it is to bring a big boat next to some crashing rocks or into shore where the boat could run aground. So um, the places that I'm most interested in mapping are the hardest places to get data from which is really frustrating. And here, you know, you can zoom in on Google Maps and you can see the exact same thing. We've got lots of information about the open ocean, comparatively little closer in, and that's why. Um, until um, we are, are very lucky at Point Lobos, we have 
uh, Cal State University, Monterey Bay, right next door. Uh, they have a seafloor mapping lab um, uh, led by um, Dr. Rick Kabitek, uh, who's shown up here. Um, they wanted to, to get sonar data of the ele like the, the elevation, the topography, really close to shore. And they thought that the best way to do it was to get a fan boat, like from the Florida Everglades, and strap it onto a jet ski and then skim over all of the kelp. They don't have to worry about prop entanglement and getting seaweed caught in the, in the propeller blades. They can get right up next to those rocks. So they can make a much, much more detailed uh, 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 sonar survey uh, than anyone could really do before. This is brand new. This is all within the last 10 years. It's very cool technology. And, uh, and you can see some of the earlier surveys done. This is actually a slightly different set of these on a tune vessel. Um, but look at, look at all the information that we can get from Point Lobos now. Uh, this is Whaler Cove surveyed. We can, we, can, we can get right up into all those little nooks and crannies. And now we can make surveys even in very shallow water, which is a really big innovation. That's really key. And look at this. All of a sudden, that, that open water where we can't see anything, it, you know, we can see these hills and valleys and, and, and almost like mountain ranges here. Um, this is a really great way to, to, to explore some never-before-seen places. Um, another cool thing about, about the sonar is that it can also pick up uh, the kelp. So the kelp can, can be um, you know, up to 100 feet tall reaching from, from, the, from the bottom of the substrate, um, uh, reaching up towards the light at the surface. And, uh, and it reflects some of that, that, uh, that sonar sound. So on this lower image here, we can see that um, the, the macrocystis, the, the, the kelp species that we're interested in here, uh, actually shows up. And we can, we can sort of get this ghostly image of this underwater forest. Um, and this is a map made by the uh, Bay Area Underwater Explorers. Uh, this is uh, uh, Gary Banta, uh, who um, I believe is a, is a member of the Point Lobos Foundation. Um, they, were, uh, they were able to commission Dr. Rick and the C4 Mapping Lab to, uh, to extend um, the coverage of their sonar mapping uh, to a, a tremendous degree. And, uh, um, and he created this map that um, uh, I'm, I'm reproducing here for, uh, with his permission um, to, to show you just how much more detail that we've gotten in the last 10 years. Um, uh, Gary went on to, to produce this really cool uh, concrete block that's at uh, Whaler's Cove. It's right in the parking lot there. Um, he didn't just make an image out of, out of the, the, the seafloor data from CSU Monterey Bay. Uh, he turned it into a three-dimensional artifact. You know, it's actually a, um, uh, a great way to show people that topography doesn't end at the waterline. Um, this, is, this is the continuation of the landscape uh, into the ocean. I think this is just such a cool project. Uh, it, it took a lot of people to get this um, um, put together. And uh, um, we're, we're really lucky that we have so many dedicated folks um, uh, making science art like this. Um, so of course, I, I was you know, trying to follow in some, in some of their footsteps. And, and I wanted to make some, some detailed maps using some of the data that had already been collected and uh, see if I could make something that was more sophisticated for the purposes of scuba diving in Point Lobos. And I started with, um, this is, this is the, the sonar data from CSU Monterey Bay. You, you probably recognize it from the slide earlier. This is just like the raw sonar data and, uh, and, and uh, it's visualized in a way to sort of imagine if the light was coming from uh, the, the upper left-hand quadrant. So um, it's an artificial hill shade. Um, and for those of you who are fans of Jurassic Park, I, I, I love that scene where uh, um, you're, if, you, if, you, if you want to, to clone a dinosaur, there are going to be a lot of pieces, like holes in the DNA, and you have to patch them with something else. Um, I was kind of doing the same thing where I had multiple data sets that were covering different parts of the world, and I wanted to smush them together in a way that um, also kind of plugged the gaps in between them so I didn't have any uh, empty spaces in the, in the data. So you can see here I have, um, uh, this is data from the land. This is captured using lasers uh, from uh, crewed aircraft. Um, this is collected from the U.S. Geologic Survey. And then you can, you can sort of recognize this is the sonar data that was done by CSU Monterey Bay. And these kind of smooth areas are places where we just don't have data. So I kind of uh, 
I added sort of a patch to it to make kind of a smooth transition between these two data sets where um, uh, uh, we, we don't have collected real data of. Um, so this is, this is uh, not, it's not particularly pretty. Uh, it's also not particularly useful, but it's certainly better than having like holes in the map. Um, uh, we also have really great satellite imagery. This is just from, from, from Google Maps, um, also Bing. We have satellites passing overhead all of the time. They're collecting really great imagery. Um, we, can, we can also use this and, and we can, we can um, uh, give the land color uh, based on, on that satellite imagery. And, and with it, you, know, you can see some of the trails here. We can see where the parking lot is. And we can see all these little offshore islands here. So this is useful information too. Um, what I then did is I, I basically uh, played cutout, like it was a collage, and I cut out all of the water parts, and I was left with all the land parts, and you can, you're starting to stack things on top of each other like transparencies. And you can see here why this area here uh, doesn't have much data. You can see these islands are probably why whoever's driving the boat didn't want to get too close. Um, so uh, any place where there are Islands popping up, uh, not a great place to, to bring your boat very close by. Um, you can also see that there's some of these weird little ridges here. That's not quite a smooth transition. Um, uh, where, where these different data sets are meeting, they're, they're forming seams. Like if you're, if you're sewing together clothing, I've got really ugly seams. Uh, yeah, so I, I pointed some of them out here. Uh, it, just, it just doesn't really look like real life. And this is the part where I want to talk about one of my heroes. This is this is Murray Tharp. Um, I'm, I'm just going to go off on a little digression here, but I assure you it, it makes sense in the end. Um, Marie Tharp is is not a cartographer. She's a she was a geologist, and uh, she was really active in the like the 40s through the 70s. Um, she had a really fascinating career. Um, at this time, there were ships sailing across the Atlantic, and and actually to to for Margaret here. Uh, here's Belfast right up here. This is actually the end point of the transatlantic cable. Um, people have been deploying transoceanic cables for telecommunications um, all the way back to the 1880s, uh, but then it was just for, for Morse code. But in the mid 20th century, uh, we were laying out these huge cables across the ocean. And, and what was really great about this particular era of ocean exploration is while you're laying the cable out, you can also use sonar to find out what the depth is at, at different parts of the ocean. Now you can see that there are a couple of different voyages that went across, but they're really thin little slivers of data. The whole rest of the ocean hasn't been surveyed, but for these narrow corridors, we have really great data for the first time ever. This is amazing. Um, and what Marie Tharp was doing was, was taking all that sonar data and turning them into profiles. Um, so here, this is sort of a compressed view of what the bottom of the ocean looks like in, in one straight profile line right across the ocean. And what she noticed, uh, which is really fascinating, is that there was this underwater mountain range that she could sort of draw a line through that it was sort of a seam between tectonic plates that met in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And um, uh, she ended up commissioning a cartographer from Austria uh, to make these beautiful paintings based on her data and, and knowledge of geology. Um, to, to create an imagining of what the world's oceans really look like. Um, a, a thing that I, I wanna emphasize here is that this really was a team effort. I know it's tempting to, to look at science heroes and, 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 and hoist them up as sort of singular geniuses, but I really think that Marie Tharp's greatest strengths were not necessarily in being a lone genius, but in being a collaborator. She was a project manager. She was working with artists, she was working with uh, her husband, who's also a geologist, um, she had a whole team of people working with her. And it was really um, her vision and dedication that really helped transform uh, how geologists see our whole planet. Um, so even though she had very little data about what the bottom of the ocean actually looks like, um, she was using drawing on her knowledge of geology to sort of fill in all of the gaps to create a uh, a representation of what the Earth probably looks like. Um, you can't visit any of these mountains. They are figments of Marie Tharp's imagination. Um, it's not important that each individual mountain is there or not. 
What is important is that the mountain range absolutely is. So um, I think a lot of people are, are, are becoming more aware of Marie Tharp's contribution to, to oceanic mapping. Um, but I think the truth is a little bit more complicated and a little more interesting. And it's giving me a lot more respect for, um, um, for the work that, that, uh, that she's now recognized for. So with, with that said, like, I, I, I do want to sort of, sort of postulate here that uh, Marie Tharp's imagination and being able to fill in the gaps between the data is probably more groundbreaking than, than uh, analyzing the data itself. Um, and and I, I took some inspiration from this. Like this is, this is relevant to the kind of thing that I'm doing trying to make a modern map of Point Lobos because um, making stuff up is a thing that cartographers do. It's sort of a, an uncomfortable reality, but um, cartography is, is, is a type of art. We are representing a very complicated planet and, and sometimes uh, making up a certain amount of data in order to create something that is ultimately more realistic or even more useful um, is a thing that's happening all the time. And, and uh, I feel like learning about Marie Tharp sort of uh, gave me a certain amount of license to try doing this myself. So what I started to do is, and this, this is kind of hard to see, but I started airbrushing my, my terrain. Um, just like if I was using like, uh, uh, your computer probably has like paint or something like that. I was using Photoshop and I was, touching up um, the elevation model that I was using to, to show the topography um, under the water. And uh, I know that that makes some people uncomfortable. Uh, do, are we allowed to make things up? And I think we are. And, and, and I'll show you the, the result of it, is that um, you know from, from the satellite imagery, I know that there are some islands out here. Many of you have been to Point Lobos. You've looked out on the water. You've seen those islands there. They're there. And they're not flat. They're not flat images. Um, even though I can't see um, underwater, I know that islands aren't just floating on the surface. They're 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 sort of cone shaped. They they pop up like a mountain, and then they're they they come up above the waterline. So what I did was I I added in 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 some of these areas where there wasn't data, I added a little cone of island so that. Um, this image of an island wasn't just sort of floating in space. I gave it some, some rock underneath it. So this isn't derived from sonar. It's not derived from technology, but in the same way that Marie Tharp was doing, like I know that this is probably closer to reality than would otherwise would be represented here and, and probably a bit more useful. Um, another thing that I got to explore when I was making these maps is symbology, like how now I've got all this data. How do I represent this to uh, lots of different people? My audience is, is mostly scuba divers, um, but I wanted to let them know that there are some places that you can't do some things. Um, Point Lobos is a uh, state marine reserve. It is the highest level of protection in the California Marine Protected Area uh, uh, designations. There are some places where you can't go fishing. There are some places where you can't uh, 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 collect shellfish like scallops. Um, and a place like Point Lobos is the highest level of protection. Uh, you're not supposed to do anything other than uh, look and experience in this area. Um, so I wanted to show that marine protected areas are actually really great things. They're, they're one of the reasons that Point Lobos is so abundant with wildlife is because we make sure that there is no fishing with, uh, with a, a line and hook from the shore. There's no spear fishing from, from divers in the water. There's no shell fishing or collection. And even if you see an empty shell, you're not supposed to take that either. Um, and I thought that I would start with like a big red X, you know, like a, like a no smoking sign or something. And then I realized that marine protected areas are great. They're, they're, they're good and we should encourage them being in more places. And I didn't want red to be associated with like a, like a no fun allowed sort of thing. So I chose green so that it's, it, it's inviting. It's like, yes, come visit this place. It is protected. That's why it's so cool. The, the light is green, uh, uh, come visit. Um, so that was a, a design decision that I made. And, and likewise, if you are outside of the boundary of the Marine Reserve, you're not even really supposed to be going diving. So um, in, in similar fashion, I added a uh, uh, no scuba fin, uh, pardon, no, no swim fins 
um, as like a, as a no swimming outside of that zone. Um, and the last design decision that I made is um, I know it's tempting to uh, use symbols that other people have used before because it's a language that everyone sort of knows how to interact with. But the um, the man and woman symbols on 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 restrooms, um, you know, they're kind of outdated. If I'm trying to tell people that there's a toilet somewhere, why don't I just use the toilet symbol? Um, you know, there there are a lot of folks that actually <laughs> a surprising number of uh, my dive buddies are queer, gender nonconforming, trans. Um, the dive community is incredibly diverse. And uh, it just seemed kind of silly that um, I'm not actually trying to communicate that this is a place where men and women go. I'm actually, if, if, if what I'm trying to tell people is that there's a toilet there, I should just use the symbol for that. Um, it just seems simpler to me. Um, the, others, the other symbol that I used is, is also a little, a little bit different than what people might be used to. Um, I don't have a compass rose. Um, I have or oriented the map so that the the it, it be, um, the top is oriented towards true north. That's how it looks like on Google Maps. Um, but true north is not the same as magnetic north. And since a lot of scuba divers are navigating with a magnetic compass um, on their kit, um, if you are only looking at your magnetic bearings, they're going to be off a little bit. And so. Uh, with this style of compass rose, I can show people where true north is, which is which is straight up and down on the, on the page, and where magnetic north is, where your compass is actually going to point, where thinking north is, uh, it's actually almost 13 degrees offset to the east. Um, so a lot of a lot of divers could potentially find that useful. And there's also a grid which is 100 yards on a on a side, uh, so that you can really quickly find out the distances to places. You don't have to do that thing where you hold your fingers up next to the scale of miles and then try to uh, inchworm your way across the page. Um, and, and finally, here is the completed result. This is, this is the map that I have produced. It's, um, you can see the, this is sort of a low image on the, on the screen sharing here, but it's, um, you can see that there's a, um, a, a lot of detail um, in some places that we haven't seen before on some of those previous maps, it combines the satellite imagery. Um, it, it includes those, uh, those little islands um, that, is, that is slightly more detailed than, than some of the other high-tech maps that have been made before me. Um, I've got these contour lines that go through here, and, and I've also added some um, uh, points of interest, some places that you might want to visit underwater, um, courtesy of the Bay Area underwater explorers like Gary Banta. Um, and then there's there's my my little uh, indicator for for um, uh, for where the, the the toilet vault is, and a little arrow to indicate where you can get in the water. Um, I'm not sure why Google Slides is giving me such poor resolution. Um, so this has been fun. I've I've I made my printouts. I've been selling my my waterproof sheets. Um, and, and I was getting a lot of fun, positive feedback about it. It made me feel really good both as a, as a diver, a member of the dive community, and, and a cartographer. Um, but then I went and I also made um, 3D maps. One of, the, one of the things that I was really excited about is I wanted to show this transition from land to ocean. You know, we go to Point Lobos and we stand at the seashore and it feels like it's the end of the land, like it's, like it's, it's just a, a, a cliff and you can't go any farther. But from the highest mountains to the deepest depths of the ocean, there's, there's a gradient, there's a transition. And, uh, and I wanted people to see the other half of the rainbow, so to speak. Um, uh, so, I, so I made this uh, 3D map, and I'm actually gonna briefly leave uh, slides here, and I'm gonna show off this 3D map, which is available at Sketchfab. And you can see the full transition from land to ocean. Um, this is a... Um, uh, uh, a, a true to scale elevation uh, 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 change. So it's, it's not exaggerated. And you, can, and you can see all the little lumps and bumps of the, um, of the land as a transition to the ocean. So that's a pretty cool innovation. I'm, I'm really, really proud of how this came out. Um, and, uh, and then I went ahead after, after making my, my individual sheets um, I, I did what I did in Point Lobos for uh, areas all across Monterey. This is, this is Lover's Point. I'm sure some of our, our locals recognize it. 
Um, and another really cool uh, um, technology that I was able to use to, to get my, my maps more out there into the hands of people who might want to use them um, is there's an app called Avenza Maps. Uh, it's a Canadian software company. And once again, I'm going to dip out of my slideshow into um, uh, a website. This is avenzamaps.com. And what Avenza Maps will do is it will allow you to uh, download a map image like, like Point Lobos and save it to your phone. So you're not, you're not browsing on an active internet connection. This is a picture that you can take with you to anywhere in the world. And uh, since GPS does not rely on an internet connection, uh, you can use this as sort of your Google Maps base map and you'll get that nice little blue you are here indicator dot, but instead of being over Google Maps, which doesn't have this information, it's over my map, which has all of that great detail. So if you're on a boat in Point Lobos, you know exactly what's underneath you uh, because GPS is telling you where you are on the Earth's surface, and my map shows you what's underneath you at that particular moment. It's a really great way to be irritating on a on a boat dive, um, if the skipper is using the sonar device to try to figure out how, how deep the water is, and I know the place that we're actually trying to go, and I know it's a little bit to the right. Um, so please don't backseat driver your boat operator, but uh, <laughs> um, let me go back to our slideshow here. And the, the, the last part of this project, and it's, and it's the part of the project that I, I reached out to, to Tracy uh, to talk about, is I made a book. Um, this is a, um, a glossy uh, magazine sort of booklet. It's, um, it includes, um, actually, <laughs> there, there are now nine uh, maps around Monterey Bay, and they all look more or less the same, but it's, it's detail of both the land and the, and the water um, with the hopes that uh, um, it will be as easy as possible for people to feel comfortable going to a new place and exploring um, this, this incredible park that, that we all know and love. I've also added some some field guides with uh, um, uh, some fish identification. If you're like me and you like to nerd out on meeting all of the locals, um, and 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 with that, you know, I also have an acknowledgments page on on the back, uh, referencing all of the the data sources that I've I've used, um, uh, including some of the software that I put together. Um, this map is going to be. Um, uh, sold at a number of dive shops around Monterey Bay. I, I believe there are, there are four dive shops right now that are selling these, uh, these booklets retail. Um, but a part that I'm really excited about and to, and to bring this all back to, to Point Lobos, um, the individual sheets of the map of Point Lobos for divers uh, is hopefully going to be approved shortly by California State Parks and it will be available um, for all of the divers who um, who come in and get registered and uh, um, get a, uh, a, a time ticket entry to the park. Um, they'll also have the opportunity to, to, to get one of these maps to take with them on their trip so that they can um, en enjoy Point Lobo State Park as, as, as much as possible and, uh, um, and hopefully see that there are so many places to visit underwater that they'll want to come back next time too. Um, 